it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. John B. Robertson and Rob McCary, all the way from Hadesburg, Mississippi. On the left there is Dr. John B. Robinson, obtained his dental doctorate at the University of Mississippi School of Dentistry, Jackson, Mississippi. He received numerous awards, with one notably being elected the president of the 17,000-member American Dental Student Association during his third year. Dr. Robertson did his residency in oral and maxillofacial surgery at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. He served as chairman of the Residents Organization of American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, as well as being one of the co-founders of ROAAOMS. Dr. Robertson holds dual board certifications. He is a board certified by the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and by the National Dental Board of Anesthesiology. He is a member of the American College of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, American Dental Association, American College of Dentists, Mississippi Dental Association, South Mississippi Dental Association, American Dental Society of Anesthesiology, and the Mississippi Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. He is also a fellow in the American College of Dentists. Besides being the co-founder of AAFDO, which is Accreditation Association for Dental Offices, he is also the co-founder of the Institute of Medical Emergency Preparedness, which developed the Emergency Response System, ERS. He has lectured and written extensively on the subject of medical sedation emergency preparedness and training. He has numerous online courses on medical sedation emergency preparedness. His buddy to the right, Bob McCrary, MBA, has been involved in various aspects of the healthcare industry for more than 25 years, including both private clinics and hospital systems. There, this experience includes managing all aspects of the healthcare environment, ranging from corporate compliance management reporting and auditing to coordinating revenue cycle management. Mr. McCurry also has experience with preparing joint commission audits as well as preparing to prevent and responding to audits from federal and state agencies. So these two guys have been buddies since they were uh, barely a meter tall and they actually, their wives are cousins. So uh, this is the, uh, this is a uh, good times. Hey, you know, I want to start off, this, this is Dentistry Uncensored, John. So I want to start off with the, uh, the, the dark side uh, of dentistry. It seems like Every month or two, somebody dies in a dental office, and it's all over social media. I mean, some of these stories, you, you look at these, a uh, two-year-old will go in. Um, one, one recently, it was a pediatric dentist, um, took her to a place, a, a board-certified anesthesiologist, put her under. She didn't wake up. And, it, man, it's on the evening news. It's all over social media. Um, do you, is it just, do we just hear about it more because... A Facebook, or has this always been going on, or what, what? What do you think about the prevalence of this? Great question. Um, it's always been going on, Howard. It's just the fact now that, as we were talking earlier about the creation of the smartphone, you have instant access to everything. So we live in a world now where we can get uh, information at our fingertips at any given time, any second. So whereas something like this mishap may have occurred, you know, fifteen, twenty years ago. We may not have caught wind of it, but now when a patient dies in a dental office or if it's dental related, um, it's picked up real quick by the news media and carried everywhere. Um, anybody can you know, find it or uh, locate it through social media. You know, I find it very interesting that, you know, there's very few, when you look at corporate dentistry, none of them are publicly traded in America. Correct. Because they have way too much debt and they're doing roll roll ups, not roll outs. And a roll up means they're just buying earnings. So they'll go get a million dollar line of credit. They'll buy a, a million dollar dental office and say, look, we, we have a million dollars in revenue. And Wall Street says, yeah, you got a million dollars of debt. Then they go get another million dollars debt. They buy another office and say, look, we're at two million revenue. And, they, and Wall Street says, yeah, but you got two million in debt. I mean, so they can't go public. But there is a few around the world, uh, two on the uh, Australian Stock Exchange, one in the Singapore, where they are public because they're roll outs, where they took money, they built dental offices that are so profitable at 20% profit margin that they actually build new dental offices with their profit. But, but these chains will not allow any board-certified anesthesiologist to put anybody to sleep in their office under 12 or over 65. And they're, they're legal lawyers looking at the actuarial data. So it's just too dangerous. They can't A publicly traded company can't put down a five-year-old for a bunch of chrome steel crowns and have her not wake up. It just, it just be, they just won't do it. So is, is that, um, 
much more high risk in your terms, under 13 over 65? Oh, no, it was under 12 over 65. Well, uh, number one, it depends on the procedure being done. And number two, the provider that's doing it, how he or she feels. Do they know their limits? Are they very comfortable in what they're doing? Um, who is doing the anesthesia for them as well, too? So, um, And are there any medical conditions that we're unaware of, whether it be under 12 or even more importantly, over the 65 age limit that you just said? As we both know, uh, being dentists, uh, look how many patients that we're treating that are medically compromised in so many different disease states, whether it be cardiovascular, diabetes, or a combination of thereof. So um, y yes, I think it has a lot to do with the patient pool that you have that you're operating on as well, too. So what, what was going on in your journey that made you guys both want to start the AAFDO, the Accreditation Association for Dental Offices, at www.aafdo? What what, what was going on in your life that made you stop and do this? Well, you know, Rob and I both discussed this along with uh, my other co-founder as well, um, Mr. Steve Harden, who uh, runs Life Wings. Uh, he's been in uh, patient safety in hospitals for over 20 years. Uh, we saw that there was an existing accreditation association for hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers. But what about dental offices? Do dental offices have anywhere they can turn to to say, hey, you know what? I perform, perform quality metrics in my practice. I do best practices every day. How can I showcase or how can I highlight that to my patients as well as to the, uh, the market that I live in, that being that city? There was nothing there, Howard. That's why we created AFDO. And John and I talked years and years ago, and this was well before even the concept of after came up, where he said, you know, Rob, it's said at some point, if dentistry doesn't do something through private organizations, there will be some entity that will come in and tell them how to do it. The government. Uh, yes, exactly. Exactly. We would, we would rather develop something that sets up these standards um, for best practices, quality health, quality dental care to do that. And then at the same time, uh, we, we've got to be compliant. Dental offices have to be compliant with all the federal uh, regulatory agencies, OSHA, HIPAA, uh, EPA. Uh, they've got to meet those things. Every, everyone's got to. If they don't, it'll shut them down uh, if they ever get audited. And those are incurring more and more frequently. I know. Um, it's, it's a big uh, deal with uh, dentists when they, when they know a dentist is totally malpractice and below the line, but they feel like, well, yeah. he's one of my homies and I can't report a dentist. It's like, dude, if you don't police your own profession, you're inviting the government to come in and do it for you. It's the same with police stations. When police stations don't take care of their bad cops, so what do they invite? The federal government to come in and they'll do it for you. So, so somebody's going to police dentistry and it's either we got to do it internally ourselves and do a really great job. I, I like that, um, you know, pilots will always say, you know, they, they do everything by checklist, and a pilot will say, if, if we're 99.99% successful on every flight, that means four airlines a day will crash in America. I mean, 99.99 yeah. .99 isn't even good enough for a pilot, and they, they everything they do is checklist, accreditation, certification. Every pilot I know, every six months has to go back down to headquarters and get in a simulation and, and get recertified, you know. Well, well, Howard, what they do is CRM, and that's where our other co-founder, Steve Harden, he's also a uh, pilot by trade also, uh, taught at Top Gun, um, and has flown F-15s into uh, aircraft carriers. So he's all about CRM, crew resource management. It's all about, that's what the checklist evolved from in airlines. Um, you know, there was a uh, general surgeon who wrote the book about checklist in hospitals and all that. And it, he took it all from the pilots. And uh, it goes back to what you just said. If we go through this checklist every single day, and this can apply to our dental offices on every single patient that we treat, we can reduce uh, medication errors, medication mishaps, um, medic, uh, medical emergencies. But yes, you're correct. If we don't do something, Howard, like you said, the government's going to step in. Uh, let me say something else. I enjoy the right as an oral maxillofacial surgeon to provide my own anesthesia. And, and I think any dentist who's ever gone on, undergone any 
IV sedation or IV anesthesia training course, they too enjoy that right. But if we don't have a way to police that and police it correctly, somebody will. Because I promise you, there's somebody out there who would love to be able to take that away from me being an oral surgeon and say, you shouldn't be providing the anesthesia, somebody else should. If you know your limits, you're careful, and do everything right, luck always favors the prepared, as I like to say in my lectures. Love, love always favors the prepared? Luck. Oh, luck. So, so you, you talk about, um, basically, you have a 400 criteria survey in 13 domains. What, what, what is the 13 domains? It's consumer information, clinical documentation, emergency preparedness, medical emergency preparedness, controlled substances, um, infection control, OSHA, HIPAA, radiation compliance, fire safety, building uh, and building codes, contingency planning, and uh, patient safety, and then also anesthesia and sedation. Now, what was the what was the one um, about? Um, start saying them again. What what was the one about uh, pain medication? Uh, control substances. Control substances. Yeah, control substances. Um, and, and that's a big topic right now, Howard. It's going to stay a big topic with the opioid crisis that we have in America. Well, you know, the first first of all, with dispensing. Um, I decided clear back in 1987, I didn't want anybody to have a reason to break into my office. I, I, um, I understand if you're an oral surgeon, you're putting people down that you have these in your office. But for a general dentist, is there really any reason at all where, why you would want controlled substances in your office? I mean, isn't that just inviting a break in? Correct. It is. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of physician practices over the years and kind of like you decided years ago, um, I've even had orthopedic surgeons that don't have it in their office. Uh, they're not doing surgery there, so they didn't have to have it there. But they're not dispensing um, the uh, even the giveaways anymore. Partly they're limited in what they can do on that. But, yeah, that's gone away even in that side of the industry, that they don't want it to where it's in their office. Number one, you got all kind of excessive regulations because of it uh, and tracking. Uh, and then – don't want somebody breaking my office for it. Well, you know, uh, when I, I was uh, when I graduated from dental school, UMKC class of eighty seven, I had two classmates that were pharmacists before. One was Kirk Glenn Denning out of Hayes, Kansas, one was Dave Castillo out of Albuquerque. And after the second time someone had put a gun to their head as a pharmacist wanting opioids, they said this isn't any way to make a living. So they both dropped out of pharmacy, went back to school and became dentists. I graduated with them. So listening to their stories, when I got out of school, it's like, well, I don't have any of that in my office. I mean, if people are going into pharmacies and putting a gun to your head for Vicodin, I mean, you know, you just don't want to have that in your office. But, you know, how we're talking about controlled substances, okay? Now, we, well, let's tie it into what you said earlier about the government stepping in. What is the government agency that controls that specific domain, controls the DEA? So as dentists... We still have a DEA number. We write narcotics. You may not have it in your office, but if you do, uh, one of the regulatory issues is you got to maintain a, a narcotic logbook, and that logbook has got to be perfect. Uh, I can't have any mishaps. Um, and it needs to be reviewed daily, looked at weekly. Um, what if you are missing drugs? What, what do you do then? Uh, unfortunately, employees sometimes can take medications and that's something that has happened in dental offices what, what about what about you in particular um when i got out of school 30 years ago the press was beating up the doctors because we were bad guys these people were dying of cancer they were going to die anyway and they're in pain and no one to give them pain med and and we're hurting people and, and so so the doctors got guilted into uh giving more pain med we were the bad guy from not giving it 30 years ago now we're the bad guy because we give it too much, and they're saying last year 51,000 people overdosed on opioid. On Dentaltown, there's big wars, even with endodontists. I mean, there's endodontists say, look, I do root canals, eight of them a day, and I have not prescribed an opioid in five years. And then other ones are saying, you know, that's crazy, it's too extreme. Where, where do you weigh? You're an oral surgeon. 
Are you still prescribing opioids for wisdom teeth extraction? Absolutely, I do, but I also prescribe non steroidals ahead of time. So I, I like to pre medicate my patients before. So, I, and I write for a very small amount of narcotics. I mean, I've read reports where uh, patients are getting 20 and 30 pills. I never write for that kind of amount of medication at all. I'd much rather see them on a uh, post operative steroid and a non steroidal, get them back to normal as soon as possible. And that's one thing I share with all my patients. But also as well, too, Howard, um, you know, back in 2014, the government stepped in and said, hey, you know, Vicodin or Lortab or Norco or Hydrocodone uh, is no longer a class three. It is now a class two. Can't even call that in. So that has changed the way I've practiced right there because before I used to have everything waiting for my patients. But that altered the way I practice. And uh, one thing I stress to all my patients is like, we're going to write you just a few of these and we're going to be done with them. That's it. And uh, I've never had a problem with them. Never have. Yeah, that, uh, you know, they, I think it's interesting how they always talk about the opioid epidemic. They talk about 51,000 died last year, but they don't put any kind of perspective because the three most abused drugs are illegal on every corner. That's sugar and fast food, uh, cigarettes at every gas station, and, um, and alcohol at, at every corner. And I always say, they, you know, they say 50,000 died of opioids. Well, how many died from alcohol last year? Uh, how many died from cigarettes last year? And how many are into morbid obesity and diabetes and getting limbs amputated because they sell Coca-Cola at every drive through on every corner? So it's like, I wish they would talk about the three legal drugs on every corner, but it's always the opioid. You know what I mean? Oh, yes. So, so what do you, so what do you want my, um, so, so what are you um, asking? That these dentists go to www.aafdo and get accredited? And, and why should they get accredited? A couple of different reasons. Uh, it is something that's going to allow the dentist and the dental office practices to show that they are above the ones next door to them. They've done the uh, due diligence to go through this process. Uh, they are hitting the high standards. They are covering their regulatory compliance. And they're providing patient safety and quality of care. Um, it's not something every state can advertise. Some people can, whether it's backed up or not. This actually gives them the ability to let someone know, especially their patients, that they've done this. Uh, I think it's partially a marketing, but more so than anything, it's a little bit of peace of mind for the dentists themselves and the, um, and the patients uh, that, that they're, where they're having their dental care done has gone through these 13 domains that are above and beyond um, what what their neighbors have done. Uh, a lot of what's in this is things every dental practice should be doing. Uh, it's just not every dental practice is doing it to the updated version uh, of HIPAA or something to that effect, or they're not doing or they thought they were doing, but when you go in there and look at it to how it should be done and done correctly, they're not being done. So it gives them that peace of mind for themselves it also goes into their even the risk management piece if you're doing this and you're prepared and you've gone through these steps can't guarantee you'll pass every audit but you'll be prepared for it and that's the main thing in any audit i've ever done uh even when there were mistakes made the fact that you were prepared and you had these processes in place that you were <laughs> if you were fine you were much you were fine to a lesser degree um, and a lot of times it was just, well, you know, this is being done to be prepared for it. Uh, it just, there was a mistake made. Those aren't as frequent. Number one, you don't have as many of them, but number two, you also, um, uh, prevent a lot of them. So the, the couple of times where somebody, you know, found a mistake, then they were, it was, a, it was mitigating that mistake because of the fact of the preparation for it. Howard, I, I like to say this, cause since you said, we have so many people listening and all that for our audience out there today. And those that listen in the future, ask yourself this question right now. If a representative from OCR, the office of civil rights, which oversees HIPAA, if they were to walk into my office today, how would I fare? Or if an inspector from OSHA walked into my office today and said, I'm going to do a surprise visit. Sometimes a gruntled employee leaves your office and uh, turns you in, all right? But nonetheless, because that's, I've seen multiple social media 
information about that too. Nonetheless, if either one of those inspectors walked in your office, how would you fare today? Bar in mind and keep in mind that OSHA fines for each fine can go up to $70,000 each fine. HIPAA up to $1.5 million. However, we're talking about people who want to start a dental practice and keep a dental practice can lose their dental practice because they didn't stay up to date with regulatory issues. That's how serious all of this is. The best way to put AFTO out there for all of our listeners, we are a confluence of risk management, patient safety, uh, medical emergency preparedness, and dental compliance, all mixed together. Like Rob said, we can't guarantee what's going to happen when they walk in, but we can sure have you prepared for that audit. And trust me, Howard, because we're getting more and more attorney firms working with our company now, coming on as OSHA slash HIPAA defense firms, they're seeing more and more audits now. And we're going to continue to see it. We even have some compliance coaches working with us as well, too. Very honored to have these knowledgeable individuals working with us. They're seeing more and more audits. It's happening. So it, it could be career defining or career ending should an OSHA or HIPAA inspector walk in your office. Yeah, there was one post on Dentaltown just yesterday of a, a million dollar fine. Wow. A one million dollar fine. Which Can we go into that? Can you tell me more what you... What? Uh, I, um, yeah, I, I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, well, it was a HIPAA more than likely, correct? Yeah, it, it was a HIPAA fine, and it was uh, for one... I mean, how, here's another question. How many of uh, my fellow dental colleagues out there have their patient software program on a laptop? How many take it home with them or an office manager take it home and forbid a break-in and that laptop's taken because one thing I just left off on my previous comment, not only now are you in a HIPAA violation, which you're about to be severely fined for, think about all of the breaches in patient data now. You are now liable for malpractice on each one of those patients. You can be legally sued for each one of those patient files that you've now lost. Well, what's the average dentist have? 5,000 active cases? Wow. I mean, this is something really serious to, to bring to heart and to ask yourself, am I doing this every day? Don't do that. So on Dentaltown, we uh, break it into 50 categories. So the difference in Dentaltown versus like uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter are just a nonstop news feed. Yes. Um, so it's, it's just not organized like a message board is. So on Dentaltown, we have 50 categories. One of them is regulation. And under regulation, we have um, documentation, HIPAA, infection control, injury prevention in the workplace, and OSHA. And uh, the uh, w which one do you think is – it seems like OSHA was the big bad boy when I got out of school in the 80s. But then uh, it seems like HIPAA is more the, the bad guy. Do you think dentists are finding more problems with HIPAA or OSHA in 2017? Uh, I, I would say HIPAA partly because it's more expensive. Um, OSHA is a little focused on what they're working on. They've got a couple of different areas they go into, but HIPAA keeps adding things to it. Uh, they updated it, um, was it uh, six, 15 or 16, um, to where they added more things to it. It's not just the privacy issues. Uh, it's also the electronic uh, protection and things like that. So it's much, I think it's much more robust. Uh, it's also newer. Um, and I think it's more lucrative for the government. Well, you know, isn't that sad if, if that's really their motive? Do you think that is part of their motive, just revenue? I, I would never say that live and in person with you. Well, it seems like you never see you never see a government agency saying, you know, we've kind of done our job. We don't need to exist anymore. We need to scale down. They're always trying to reinvent themselves to get bigger budgets and more employees. I mean, it's like rule number one of every agency the, the guy running it, their only, only self-esteem is that, well, next year I want to have twice as many employees and twice as big a budget. They, you know, they just, um, yeah, uh, don't get me started on the government. But, uh, well, I, but, but I, I, have seen, I have seen some circumstances, uh, and, it's, and it's not HIPAA. Um, it, was a, it was some other audits. 
Um, and it was what was being documented, what was getting paid, and they would pay the regular rates, and they'd come back and take them back. And I want to think it ended up being that those that fought the um, penalties and the fines, 80% or 85% was successful, but only 30 or 40% were fighting them. But they just didn't have the resources for the smaller offices and the smaller hospitals that had the resources to go back and fight that. So I, I do believe that's in there. They have budgets. They've got to adhere to. And if they can bring money in, they've they've helped meet their own budgets and their own existence. So, well, when, Howard, when, when, how, yeah. let me throw this at you because this has become such a hot topic. The ADA just came out with last last month called Managing the Regulatory Environment. Please allow me to read the very first page what they say. Adherence to current regulations and guidelines is one of the most challenging aspects of running a dental practice, especially since it requires dealing with so many different agencies. Being knowledgeable about current regulations and working towards compliance are critical steps for practices to achieve both a safe dental practice and peace of mind. This is everything that we're all talking about t- together right now, Howard. Um, it's all about taking care of the patients, making it the highest patient-centered, safest quality of care that there can possibly be. And I mean, some of the regulatory agencies that they focus on this article, Center for Disease Control, CDC, uh, CMS, for, that covers both Medicare and Medicaid, the DEA, OSHA, OCR, which I already mentioned, which is, of course, HIPAA right there. So there are some major governmental agencies, and each one have their own directors, and each one have their own ideas and thought processes on on how to treat a dental office. So you've got to stay up to date in each one of these parameters, or we like to call domains. Well, I hope you build an online CE course for this under uh, under our category for regulations. I think... uh, you creating a course going over those 13 domains, would you be interested in something like that? Sure, and I, I love, Howard, for us to get together and maybe uh, visit all of the different message boards out there, because I've done it before in the past, sharing my knowledge with uh, documentation for medical emergencies, and uh, I, I love to get out there and just post something on each one of the message boards saying, look, AFTO is here, you know, we're, we're here to help you, we're going to coach you, we're going to get you through this. We want to see every dentist succeed. We want to see accreditation happen in your office, all right, because we're not a regulatory agency. We're an accrediting agency, all right? We're voluntary, 100% elective voluntary process. It's up to the dentist if he or she wants to undergo this, but we want to make this available for every dentist in the United States. Well, you know, when you're when you're trying to be a leader, like they'll, they'll tell their team, uh, you know, we got to cut down on – patient cancellations and no-shows. And the whole staff's like, yeah, we, we all agree. And, and then the doctor leaves. I mean, employees, you know, you, you need to show them the way. You need details. If I went up to any office and say, do you, do you think this dental office should um, uh, increase our safety and our regulatory compliance and our emergency responses and our office security and our infection control? They'd all say, yeah, but, but they need details. They, you need to show them a plan. And I love the way that you guys are so detail-oriented. I mean, you have a comprehensive 400 criteria survey. That way you can tell your staff, we, here, we need to do this, but here's the way. Here, here's how you follow the yellow brick road and get all the way to Emerald City. Yes. And, and, and as Rob can contest also, Howard, um, we have steps to get you there, all right, We're through these 400-plus criteria through our surveys and stuff because it's all broken down in the 13 domains. And we have a little mini survey that we ask out of each one of our offices doing this so you can get an idea like, gosh, I'm behind. But now as a dentist, I'm asking all of you out there, don't be hard on yourself if you go in there and do the survey and you find there's a lot of deficiencies in there because there are the regulations are quite tight. And Rob can talk a little bit further also about what we do with our coaches and all that stuff to get all of our practices through this entire process. And I'll jump on that a little bit. Um, what, one of our first beta sites was Dr. Robertson, of course. Um, and in doing so, and I'm a patient, well, I don't know if I'm a patient, but my family's a patient. I think everybody but me has had teeth removed here. Um, 
so high quality, high quality uh, office, and we ran through everything with him and did great on a few, on most everything. But there were a couple of areas where he was either out of date or a little deficient in. They were doing some aspects of it, but it wasn't to the detail that the auditor would require. Um, so, and like what Rob's saying, it, had somebody walked into my office, one of those inspectors I said earlier, I would not have fared well. And my staff took it hard because they give me 100% every single day. Um, I think they took it harder than he did. Yes. They were like, I can't believe we didn't do this right. And John was like, oh, we can fix that. We, we, we can correct <laughs> it. There, there's ways. I mean, that's why we developed what we did. So, you know, I, here I am being one of the co-founders. I'm, I'm extremely critical of myself. But guess what? We're up to snuff right now. If somebody were to walk into my office, we're going to do very well. We have all of these areas covered right now. What, what do you What do you say as a board certified uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeon? Um, there are a lot of people um, in the government, and more so in the United Kingdom, that say in every hospital in America, the surgeon say say you're doing a bypass. The cardiovascular surgeon cannot do the anesthesia. They separate anesthesiologist surgeon in every hospital in America and the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom has been trying very hard to say, why is this not the practice in dentistry with our oral surgeons? And the United Kingdom has been trying to uh, uh, say the oral surgeons need to start acting like the hospitals and separate those two procedures. Whereas you're doing, you're doing the work of two people. You're doing the work of a board certified anesthesiology and a board-certified oral and maxillofacial surgeon. What, what do you think of that argument, that those should be separate? Well, you think healthcare is expensive now. Go ahead and implement that model exactly. in America. Okay? Exactly. Right. Because not, not, let's just don't stay with just oral surgeons. Uh, periodontists, endodontists, general dentists, or pediatric dentists, any one of those that are trained in any form of IV anesthesia, what you just said from what Great Britain wants to do, that right – is being taken away from us. Somebody else is coming into it. Healthcare, or I should say dental healthcare, just skyrocketed out of the roof. Because you just said also, uh, I think I saw somewhere on one of your other previous podcasts talking about 50% of America just wanting to go to the dance. They're scared to death. It is awesome that any of us out here in America that perform any form of IV anesthesia, how we can help our patients relax and treat them appropriately and accordingly, that they're in a safe environment. Yeah, I mean, you know, the only secret to lower prices is lower cost. And I think that's what uh, really bit Obama bad. You know, when he had great ideas of um, not, you know, not uh, being exempt from pre-existing conditions, leaving your kids on your health care insurance until you're 25, but they never address cost. They always have great ideas that come from the heart, but they never have a great idea to lower costs. And what's so funny is on that um, on the last Obamacare, every I mean, twenty other different countries, I mean, they 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 threw up their hands like you know, thirty percent of America's cost is administration. Why didn't they? Why didn't Obamacare address any of those issues? I mean, they they could have cut the cost of health care twenty percent across the board. But they never have a great idea on cutting costs. So, like, here's a great idea. Well, maybe we'll save one kid if we separate the anesthesiologist from the pediatric uh, dentist or the oral surgeon. Oh, okay. It just keeps getting more and more expensive. It seems like they never have an idea to make anything lower cost. They just have an idea to raise the cost of everything. And what um, I some of, some of my most favorite economists in the world, um, like the late. Um, um, Oh, what was it? Uh, who was the little guy? His wife, uh, Rose, um, Milton Friedman, and his wife Rose. Uh, Milton Friedman got all the credit, but his wife Rose was the PhD economist who sat in the office and crunched all the numbers and made Milton look so smart. But they went to their death saying, "What Americans don't get is that they always complain about how high their taxes are, but their regulations cost them more money than their taxes." And that the greatest tax on society is the hidden tax of regulation. And, um, you know, so he was always fighting regulation because he says, if you think your taxes are expensive, you have no idea what you're paying for the price of all these regulations. OSHA, 
hip, uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Right. Well, and then once you start that, then you create a bureaucracy that doubles and triples and quadruples the cost in the first couple of years. I mean, how many people would have had their health care paid for for free just by the cost of HIPAA? <laughs> uh, I mean, probably, are, you, are you talking about the 20 million that wasn't, weren't covered? I, I mean, I mean, the, the cost of HIPAA could have paid for the health care of millions of Americans. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's the point that these economists are trying to tell you that, you know, if, if you go in and, I mean, how many jobs have been lost because of the cost of OSHA? How many yeah. people don't have a job today because the factory said, screw this, I'm going to go to Mexico or China. Uh, so, so here's OSHA to protect you. And then they're just like, okay, well, we're going to China. We'll talk to you later. And you know, Howard, what's looming in the future? What new government agency is about to be created? Is you know, since we have such an issue going on with the opioid crisis right now, is there a, is there going to be a new spinoff from the DEA? Little do we know, is there something looming out there that will be a whole brand new standard? Because one thing, Rob and I and the rest of the team at AFTO, this is an evolving science here as far as our domains because. That's the reason why with accreditation, it's every three years because something new could have occurred in some form of a new regulation. And we'll have that covered the next time around. I, I do I do have to ask you something very cynical about this opioid addiction where, you know, so hydrocodone, uh, which is Vicodin or oxycodone, yes. which was Percocet, was basically five milligrams of, of hydrocodone plus 325 milligrams acetaminophen, right? And then the doctors were saying, well, sometimes we need a pain pill that doesn't have all this Tylenol in it. Can we make one without acetaminophen? So then they come out with Oxycontin. But it wasn't five, a five milligram tab. I mean, the smallest one was 50 milligram. I mean, how did they go from five to 50? I mean, don't you think that was a big cynical part of the problem? It's like, okay, well, I want this hydrocodone without the acetaminophen. Okay, well, you'd think they'd just give you a five milligram tab, but they gave you a 50 milligram tab. Don't you think that was a big, huge part of this epidemic that the dose was way, 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 way too high? And I, and I think they found that the uh, big pharma company that was involved with it, who made millions and millions and millions of all Billions. Let me back up, billions, you are correct. So um, that, that was probably one of the feeders to all of this as well too. So yeah, I think it was intentional, don't you think? Don't you think they absolutely knew that? Oh, I, you, you have to believe so that they did. Um, because like you said, you went from five milligrams all the way up to 50 milligrams of oxycodone. All right. That's a significant jump, especially in quote, chronic or acute pain management or chronic pain management. Yeah. And I have a friend of mine who's, uh, who's a uh, patient of mine for 30 years. I mean, he started coming in 1987 and we just had lunch the other day and he always has kind of a, um, a, a crink in his neck and, and, and a lower back. He always has lower back and neck issues. And every time he goes to his doctor, his doctor writes him 60 Vicodin. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, hey, I mean, I mean I 60 more, Vicodin for a chronic... This is more physician-related than it is dentist-related. I don't know a single dentist ever written for 50 pills of a, a narcotic. All right? I don't know. Do you... No, I, I don't know of anybody who ever wrote one for 20. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, of course, if, if it happens in healthcare, it's going to trickle down to us in the, the profession of dentistry. So you also mentioned the EPA. How is the EPA tied into dentistry? Is that with the, the mercury? Um, the, the, yes. The, water lines and all that. The what? The water lines. Yeah. Water line infection. Uh, the uh, amalgam. Yeah, I know a lot of dentists here in Arizona fought those regulations over the years, but I, I always thought the dentist should own that problem. I mean, um, I noticed that there's factories out here in Phoenix like Intel, and they make some of the most toxic stuff in the world, but they take care of all their own wastewater, and when they're all done, they, re they, they return the water completely purified. I mean, it would just be insane if Motorola and Intel were dumping all this crap into the, uh, the wastewater and then the city of Phoenix had to deal with it. And it's the same with the mercury. When, when they look at the mercury in the water, it's pretty much all coming from dental offices. And so it's just a lot cheaper for the dentist to scavenger and clean this stuff out at the point of entry instead of mixing it in with 
all the water and toilet water from four million people living in the valley. You know, I, I mean, I, I think I think you should clean up your own mess. You know, I, I like user fees. Um, like, I don't think uh, um, the general taxes should pay for um, um, the Grand Canyon because if you're a little old grandma and you, you're never going to go to the Grand Canyon, why should you be subsidizing some family who wants to go vacation there? You know, when when you go to the Grand Canyon, you should pay when when you go. And um, but anyway, so um, do you think a lot of dentists are compliant with that mercury scavenger system? I, I think it's coming around. Um, I think part of it depends on your state too. Certain yeah. states regulate that differently. Um, one of the things we've looked at in not just this area, but other a couple of places where uh, one state may have a regulation in one speed and something like that. And somebody said, well, what happens when the dentist says, well, I don't have to do that in my state on, on part of our accreditation process? Well, we look at that as, well, we're not a state agency. We're not even a federal regulation agency. We are best practices. And here's what you should be doing. Um, and so it goes more into that. This is what you should do. Uh, this is the best practice uh, for to get accreditation. This is what this is what you the level you have to practice. It's not just any. Um, but you know where EPA is drop, you know where EPA is dropping the ball though on amalgam though, totally dropping the ball. When you study atmospheric um, mercury contamination, 50% of it comes from burning coal. 50% of the mercury in our air is from burning coal. Do you know where 6% of it comes from? Cremating humans that have amalgams in their teeth. Wow. And what I feel sorry for is that poor boy in Mississippi who's cremating, you know, four or five people a day. He's in the room when that when that mouthful of amalgams has been heated up towards dust, and then that's the poor bastard who opens that door. I mean, he's getting knocked over with, with, with this stuff, and if 6% of the atmospheric mercury comes from cremated humans, they need to pass laws that says no one can be cremated until a dentist drops by with, a, with his pliers and, and his 150 or 151s. I mean, you don't, you don't have to pull out the roots. If you just break off the crown... You're all good, but you know you don't need any sedation. It'd be the only patient that won't argue with you, and, but you can't <laughs> keep cremating humans with amalgams in Mississippi all day, every day. I mean, that's just that is such a low-hanging fruit way to stop some of this mercury emission. Uh, yeah, you created a new specialty of dentistry. Oh, that's what I want to specialize in. <laughs> I want to do oral surgery on dead cadavers only. <laughs> they only have amalgams in their teeth. And they have to prepay because, you know, if they don't prepay, they're not good for it afterwards. Well, they prepay for funeral calls. So why couldn't you say the uh, end-of-life dental calls or something like I, that? I've heard that once you've been cremated, you're not very good at paying your bills. Probably not. No. But, uh. So, and I also think it's interesting, you know, HIPAA, a lot of people don't realize, did come from OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, because sure. HIPAA actually started as a civil rights deal. And the way I read it, the way I saw it unfold, it had to do with, really, it came down to HIV. There's a lot of people who are afraid their HIV status was going to get re revealed. And I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back, that the uh, Health Insurance um, Privacy Portability Act was um, that that this should be private? That if that if, you know if you have this disease, it should be private and people should handle it in privacy. So it did come from the Office of Civil Rights. That's kind of an interesting uh, place where this came out. Oh, and I think also it was just bottom line. Maybe people were just sharing information freely over the internet or text or talking about I treated this patient or that patient. It may not just be HIV, however, maybe also, you know, stuff like Alzheimer's, dementia. Uh, pe people just didn't want to know their stuff shared with other people. Uh, so this evolved, like you said, from, quote, they call it the privacy rule, and then that evolved into what we have today yeah. with HIPAA. And if I'm not mistaken, when it first came out, the portability was the bigger selling point for it um, than any other aspect of that. It seems like the privacy got added to it. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, portability was the political piece of that that really pushed it to begin with. Um, and then they added the privacy in there with it. Well, the explain the portability. What, what, what does that really mean, portability? Um, it didn't really work. Um, 
the the intent was it to be able to move your insurances. Uh, if you left one business, be able to take it with you. Um, if you had, that was the start of some of their pre-existing stuff that they did. Uh, if you have this disease, you should be able to, you should be able to move it. If you had, um, like you said, HIV, uh, and you lost your job or whatever, you lost your insurance at that, at that time, they were trying to set it up to where you had the ability to move it. Really what you got at that point was just being able to take it at a higher, higher rate, um, and not lose it then. So the insurance company had to allow you to keep it at a higher rate and not the company paying for it. Um, so what does this, a, what does, uh, if, if my homies go to www.aafdo.com for accreditation association for dental offices, how much does this cost? How much time does this, uh, uh, t- tell them the more uh, dentistry uncensored details. Okay. Um, the price is $29.99, $2,999. Um, and that's if your local um, local anesthetic and um, nitrous, oxide. nitrous oxide. If you do more advanced levels uh, than that, then it's uh, $3,999 um, due to the fact for the medical emergencies and much more, uh, have a little more detailed questions. Okay, so the- local <laughs> and nitrous, it's twenty nine ninety nine, but Correct. it's thirty nine ninety nine if you do what? Well, if you do any form of advanced anesthesia, um, if you do oral sedation, if you do moderate sedation, if you do deep sedation, if you do general anesthesia, or if there might be some practices as far as the oral surgeons are concerned that might be doing inhalational anesthesia there. So we have an extra, our 13th domain is anesthesia sedation. So after our auditors get through going through your office, they then go through about a 100-point uh, checklist, all dedicated to medical emergency, sedation emergency preparedness, emergency drugs, emergency equipment, staff training, and dentist training toward medical and sedation emergencies. Man, that, um, that child who uh, died last year in um, Hawaii, um, when, uh, when she um, didn't, re- didn't recover, they, they left her sitting up in the chair with her head lumped over while the doctor and everybody ran down the halls looking for someone to come in and help. Isn't that just amazing? Well, okay, Howard, I hate to say it. To me, it's not because being in that field and writing on this and lecturing on this for about 20 years now, the stories that I've been told, whether I was at a trade show and I had staff members come up and tell me different things, the stuff I've read from malpractice claims, uh, it, it always seems to go back to several things, Howard, um, a delay in the treatment of the emergency, a delay in calling 911, um, a delay in trying to locate emergency drugs or not even having emergency drugs in date. All right. Um, the, the, we talk about the number of deaths uh, each day in America related to the opioid crisis. Let's talk about sudden cardiac arrest. A thousand people die every day in America. From a sudden cardiac, and there's only one treatment for that, Howard. It's called an AED, automated external defibrillator. For some reason, people love to call it automated electric defibrillator. I don't know why, but it's not electric. It's external, all right? But that's the only treatment for an SEA. And every minute you wait to shock after about four minutes, there's a 10% decrease in survivability. And unfortunately, I think right now in America, only 14 states require dentists to have an AED. Man, we, we're talking about our, what we do for a living. People are nervous and scared to death when they come to our office. Yeah, see, there's my point. So they talk about the opioid epidemic all day, every day, it's every news station. Oh. And that's 51,000 deaths, but 365,000 deaths, 1,000 so a day. So correct. Yes. And see, the thing about it, I'm so happy to see that BLS also teaches AED training because – you know, look, look at every airport you fly in. Right. Check the walls about every 100 yards. There's an AED for a reason right there. All right. But you being a dental health care professional, you're trained to do that. You could save somebody's life if they have a sudden loss of consciousness, not breathing, and no pulse. Those are the three signs and symptoms of a sudden cardiac arrest. And you need to get that defibrillator. What are the three symptoms sudden again? Sudden loss of consciousness, no pulse. No breathing. Yeah. 
But a lot of my uh, married patients, especially the retired married men, uh, they have a do not resuscitate tattoo right on their forehead. <laughs> They're like, if I have a sudden loss of consciousness, no pulse, no breathing, please do not resuscitate. <laughs> well, as long as they've signed a DNR form in your <laughs> office, you're good to go. But, you know, you just had a, uh, <laughs> an, an excellent example. You said only 13 states require a dental office to have an AED? 14. 14. And you're saying that a lot of people say, well, this isn't required in my state. Well, you're not a regulatory agency. You're a best practices. So, so you're going into a dental office saying, okay, well, this might not be mandatory for your state, but 14 states do mandate it, and we think it is the best practice. That's correct. Well, and another thing, too, we talked about earlier about malpractice as well, too. You're going to be hard-pressed to be able to prove yourself um, in a legal courtroom in the event somebody has a sudden cardiac arrest in your office and you didn't have a defibrillator. Because when they say, did you take BLS training? Yes, I did. Did they teach you how to use an AED? Yes, they did. Well, how come you didn't have an AED? Because yeah. you could have saved this patient's life. All right, because I, I, the other thing, too, you know, I talked about the delay in 911. More than likely, an ambulance, ambulance is not going to be at your office in five minutes when you call. And that 10 or 15 minutes you're there with that unresponsive patient hour, I've talked to Dennis, I've read about it. It's the longest time period of your life. All right, what do I do? I can't believe it because... Many people can't believe this is happening to them. And then they go into a state of panic when you panic, guess what? Chaos. And nothing, simple skills are forgotten then. It's, it's such a shame. But all it takes is just some regular training, regular, uh, you know, works as far as, you know, monthly mock drills. You can have yourself ready every single day in your office. You know, I am, it is so different urban versus rural because I'm in, down, I'm in Phoenix. And um, I've had to call 911 twice. One was for a stab. My office manager fainted. And uh, um, but anyway, they're they're exactly one mile from my office. I mean, they're there in just no time at all. I mean, just like, and you're very fortunate. Yeah, you're but I could fortunate. imagine uh, being out in uh, in in Eloy or Florence or someplace far away. I mean, I bet I bet I mean I don't have any data, but I imagine the fire department's response time is significantly longer in many part in rural parts than obviously in downtown Phoenix. Right. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I want to go back to you ask about how long it would take to do the process. Uh, part of that's going to depend on the practice and how prepared they are. Um, what we've seen in the beta test and we were doing is that um, it, it, it is pretty extensive. Uh, and so we developed a process. Um, first time we did it, we just did the live survey. Uh, but we've gone ahead now and done it where it's, they do a self-survey first. So you kind of go through most of the uh, criteria in all the different domains and answer those for yourself and then um, and, and provide us with some paperwork of different forms you use and things like that. And then we provide that back to the surveyor. And then they, they will come in and do a virtual survey. And uh, virtual survey, basically what we're doing is doing a Zoom, Skype, some type of video thing, and walking around the dental office with the surveyor. Um, the couple of times I've done it, I've been on an iPad. Uh, five minutes into it, I would say didn't realize that, you know, the person wasn't there with us. We were pulling up bottles of medication, checking dates. Uh, we were walking through the process of the autoclave of keeping that clean and the virtual survey is two hours but the real legwork from the dental office is on the self-survey where they go through that and answer the questions of what they're prepared for and then the other part that would be detailed is if you have areas that need remediation and that we need to work with you to get up to speed that's going to take that'll take some time also so i cannot tell anybody how long it takes because it's never been the same for anybody we've done but it is resource intensive. Uh, it's not a rubber stamp. It's not just here's a piece. Here's 400 questions. Just mark them, and we're going to we're going to send you a certificate. We actually come in behind that and verify everything. So, what if someone has some questions about this? How, who do they? Can they email you? Call you? How, how do they contact you? Yeah. Uh, the website is www.afdo.com. We've mentioned that before. You, there's a contact us uh, link there. Uh, phone number, welcome that phone call, is 866-902-2336. Uh, 
That's 866-902-2336. What about or 866-90-AFTO. Huh. Say it again. 866 90 AFTO, A A F D O. 866 90 AFTO, A A F D O. You got yes. it. Man, that's, that's slick. That's very good. Good job getting that phone number. Yeah, yes, how about that? Yeah. And um, and so, what percent of the time does, does, does that $29.99, unless you do sedation, $39.99, does that include someone coming to your office or is this all done remotely? Remotely. Yeah, remotely. It's all and done online and remotely. Yes. Yeah, we're very proud of our virtual inspector. Like what Rob was talking about, we go through Zoom info, and, and he did with my office just doing an iPad, and my staff said they felt like the person was right there. So we are initiating and utilizing high technology here, Howard, and uh, therefore you don't have to worry about someone flying into your office and taking up your time and all that, going through everything and having to pay for an inspector to stay overnight and all that stuff. Yeah, and it's much less intrusive. Yes. Um, we, we try to do it in two hours. Um, and who usually is your point of contact for this? Is it usually the dentist, the office manager, the assistant? Who's, who are you uh, usually working with? All three. Any, all three. Uh, four. Um, I, I, it, it depends on the practice. Uh, I've got one I'm working with right now. It's the dentist. Uh, the other one, the dentist and the office manager, and another one's the assistant. So, um, so yeah, it's. And then uh, they can use this logo in their on their website, their advertisement as a form of market differentiation that this office is accredited. Correct. Yes. Yes. Highly recommend that. Yeah, I really like your logo, Accreditation Association for Dental Office Demonstrating Excellence, AAFDO. Thank uh, you. That is a uh, – so have you tried to go for uh, – um, there's 35 um, corporate dental uh, chains that have over 50 locations. Have you tried to get one of uh, the uh, – a really big account by trying to get one of the, the big boys to do this? I think that would be an excellent idea. Um, we, we are, we will be talking to those guys too. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I, I podcast a lot of them. I mean, Rick Workman at Heartland Dental, he's got what, 700 offices, uh, Stephen Thorne at Pacific, he's got 500 offices. Uh, um, but yeah, I would think, uh, it seems like, it seems like going around the world, if, if it's a really no brainer business decision, the, the corporates are, will always buy first. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the, the dentist has to think about it. Their analysis their paralysis by over analysis. Uh, but when I look at some of these uh, patient financing schemes, some of these um, in-office insurance plans, I mean, the, the, the corporates just jump right on it. You know, they, they, they see the merits of it. I, I would, I would uh, go to those guys. Well, Howard, we would welcome the opportunity for an intro from you to them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> send me an email and I'll reply back and CC them. Yeah. Oh, great. Right. Yeah, yeah, send, send me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com. By the way, I asked that you homies to, uh, I'm always curious who's listening because uh, I know who you are on Dentaltown, but I don't know who you are on uh, iTunes or a lot. But um, I've, I've always had this um, this thought that they were mostly all millennials, uh, which is born after 1980, and not a lot of uh, old timers, uh, baby boomers like me who are 54. I think all three of us are 54, right? Correct. Or you're, or you're almost. <laughs> you're at. What, what do you? I'm almost. How many more days do you have till you're 54? Catch up, catch up with me and Rob. September 30th. <laughs> but what I was really surprised about is that, and I'm going to ask you, to, you know, send me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com. Tell me who you are and how old you are, where you are in your dental career. I can't believe how many D2s. I, I haven't got any D1s, but I've had about, I don't know, like 25 emails of kids who are an undergrad that are still applying to dental school. I'm like, where the hell did you even hear this podcast? And, uh, but so, because when I was in dental school, it seemed like all you're worried about is finals and trying, trying to pass your final exams. And then when you were in clinic, you were just worried about graduating and all you really cared about is graduating. Th these kids are in um, undergrad. So many of them are D2s and D3s. It's about 20% of all the emails. They're, they haven't even graduated with a dental degree yet. Isn't that amazing how the world is uh, so much different now? These uh, with smartphones and podcasts and YouTube and all that stuff like that. It's it's really a brand new world. So um, so who is your bread and butter account mostly? Is it oral surgeons? Pediat is it people using sedation like 
pediatric dentists, periodontists, oral surgeons, or any, any general, any general office out there. But but who but who is your but who's mostly calling you? I mean, is it is it more general dentists? Is it more specialists? Yeah, but kind of kind of set it up for general. It's targeted initially at general dentists. Um, and what percent of these general dentists are doing um, the advanced uh, uh, sedation, oral sedation, moderate sedation? The the thirty nine ninety nine versus the the twenty nine ninety nine. Ooh, I don't know what percentage. Um, you, you've got a lot of general dentists that are just doing the local. And, yeah, and local nitrous, and nitrous. Nitrous. I, I, I can't believe how many people don't use nitrous, and and I'm also, also um I mean I know endodontists who don't use nit that don't even have nitrous in their office. Like, how could you be in the root canal business? And not yes. even have uh, um, nitrous oxide. In fact, I always complained about that with my four boys. You know, when you have, I, I raised four boys. Now they're uh, 22, 24, 28, and 26. But, uh, you know, so many times you'd take them to the emergency room and they'd be in a ton of pain. I, I always thought, well, why don't you guys have nitrous in here? I mean, I mean, <laughs> not, you know, you could really relax this kid a lot if you just put him on nitrous before he starts stitching his arm. You know what I mean? Or, you know, oh, they're yeah. pretty... You know they're 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 putting sutures in skin unesthetized, and um, but um, so so that's really the draw that that's really the line between the twenty nine ninety nine and thirty nine ninety nine is if you're just doing local anesthetic with nitrous, and the line is crossed when you start using uh, pharmacology oral sedation. Right. Yeah. And see the other thing too, Howard, with the uh, advanced anesthesia, we feel also. We're, we're going to have a spinoff division of AFTO related to strictly anesthesia and sedation down the road. We've already discussed this because so many state boards have to go in and inspect dental offices. So see, here's another regulatory agency. It's a state dental board that's got to inspect these offices to make sure everything's up to par as far as emergency drugs, emergency equipment, training for both staff and doctors. And this is where AFTO can actually assist state dental boards because you know as well as I do, they're undermanned and there's so many dentists out there in each one of our great states. And how can you inspect every office thoroughly? Well, we can do it virtually through our uh, virtual inspector. Nice. So we, we can help state boards there as well too. But Howard, one other thing you'd asked earlier about how to reach us at AFTO, we also have our contact us section on our webpage, as well as Rob's email address is rmccrary at afto.com. McCrary, oh, a good R Irish R name. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Or you can reach me at jrobertson at afto.com, J-R-O-B-E-R-S-O-N at afto.com. So if you're an I'm MC, here. you're a Mick, like McDonald's. I'm I'm a hundred percent Irish, but you know you're uh, John. You're Robertson without a T. Usually it's Robertson, but you're uh, you're Robertson. The only other Robertson I know is uh, Andre Robertson, who plays for the Oklahoma City uh, Thunder. Right? Is, are, are you a big fan of him? Since you have the same last name? Well, I, I know of him, and uh, uh, I follow more football and baseball down here where we are than I do basketball. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, uh, that was a fast hour. I can't believe it went five minutes over. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Robertson and Rob McCrary, uh, for coming on the show today and telling us about AAFDO. I thought it was extremely informative. And uh, I think what you guys are doing is amazing. Uh, I hope you uh, go to the uh, section on Dentaltown on their regulations and uh, drop some uh, message board posts in there or maybe okay. create an online C course or whatever. But I just want to thank you so much for all that you're doing for dentistry and for coming on the show today. Howard, let me just say a couple of things to you. Um, love to talk to you more about, I'm even willing to come out there to Arizona. If we want to sit down and do like an online CE course on AFTO or something like that. Uh, do y'all do that there or how do you do that? Uh, we, we do that, but sometimes uh, Howard Gold, so I'm Howard at dentaltown.com, but the guy that does the CE is Howard Goldstein, so he's HOGO. For H O G O for Howard Goldstein downtown dot com. A lot of times he flies uh, to your office. He he's in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm um, that's uh, I met Howard in um, the uh, lecture that time in Las Vegas. Great guy. Yeah, he is a great guy, and uh, he's uh, over in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. But uh, yeah, so Ryan, did you email Hogo? Uh, okay, so yeah, we've already emailed you and Hogo, and he's already replied. 
Oh, right. awesome. Right. Okay, well, look, but, look that but remember, um, you know, if you get a, you know, like say yesterday someone posted a deal that it, they had a HIPAA fine of $1 million, and, you know, for a $1 million, you could almost get a divorce for that kind of money. <laughs> but, I mean, look, you, okay. I'm just, that just, almost. That, huh? that, almost. That, that just crippled you financially because you haven't even started thinking about the monies you're going to pay to go fight this. No, I'd say the crippling fine I got was a $3.8 million divorce. I, I would have, I would have much rather had the million dollar HIPAA fine any day of the week. Yes. <laughs> Listen, Howard, I, and now we love, we love. I love that idea about you introducing us to Rick Warren and all those guys. Yeah, shoot me an email, and I'll reply. Shoot me an email, and I'll reply to a uh, bunch of those uh, uh, CEOs, and um, and um, and I'd love to get a quote from you. What you would say, like. Hey, Howard says this about AFTO. I'd love to get a quote from you if you could work up something to send it to Rob. All right, buddy, you're on. Again, All right. Thank you so much for, I know you guys are busier than a one-armed paper hanger. Thank you so much for spending an hour on my show today. Thank you again, Howard. So great seeing you again. We thoroughly enjoyed it. We appreciate you so very much. Howard, it's a pleasure, pleasure meeting you and pleasure being part of the show. All right. Thank, so are you? how far are you guys from the ocean? 60 miles. Oh, uh, what what is that resort? I they always have me Mississippi Dental Associate always has me stay at a casino on the ocean. What which one is that? Beau Rivage. Oh my God, that's gorgeous. Yeah, but wait a second. Have you ever been to the San Destin Hilton Resort on the ocean? Yes. Oh, you well, mean so. in Florida? In yeah. San Destin, Florida. Oh yeah, I, I I've been there a dozen times. In fact, yeah, I got I got to tell you the funniest story of San Destin, Florida. The first time I ever went there, flew into the airport. Rented a car. I told him where I was going to go to Sandestin Airport. And you know what the lady told me? I, you can't even make this up. She goes, see that road there? You just drive straight down that road, and on the 13th Waffle House, turn right, and you're there. And I thought, <laughs> oh, my God. I've never heard. This was before, you know, cell phones and GPS oh. and all that stuff. And oh. I swear to God, there are actually 13 Waffle Houses <laughs> from the airport to Sandestin. And then, you know, it's halfway in the middle of the night. You're like, okay, was that the eighth one or the ninth one? And you're counting on your fingers. But uh, that, 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 is, uh, that was the most hilarious. But, yeah, but I'll tell you what, that, that golf, those resorts on the golf, man, you don't have to go to Hawaii to get the most awesome beachfront view. San Destin, what was the name of that casino, Mississippi? Beau Rivage. Beau Rivage? Yes. Yeah, and uh, my gosh, that is, just, that is just gorgeous. Oh, it's fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, what do they call it? Red was it red bass fishing or red red something red red fish? Red fish. Yeah, yeah. I, I I always go on the um. I always buy the fishing uh, um, cruise guide, and it's the uh, for the um, red fish. Um, you know, a boat takes you picks you up in the morning, takes you out. Fishing. Do you like to fish? What's that? Do you like to fish? Oh yeah! Every time I go to the golf, everybody else wants to lay on the beach. I just want to go out there and catch fish, but. I mean, it was crazy out there. I mean, we were one one when I was down there in Mississippi, we were way out the way from the beach and actually found a sandbar in the middle of the Gulf. Yeah, well, there. I mean, Mississippi oh. coast is surrounded by islands, so you got to go to the islands, past the islands, and or either fish on the islands. I, I do a lot of uh, marsh fishing more than deep sea fishing, and uh, specks and reds. Have you ever been to Venice, Louisiana? I don't think I've been to Venice. Okay, Howard, look, Rob and I, we'll, 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 our treat, we just got to get you to come to New Orleans. We'll pick you up at the airport, and then Venice is about 75 miles south. We'll go speckled trout fishing and red fishing, and you'll love it. Oh, man, I love fishing in the Gulf. That, that's all this city is, though, Howard, nothing else. It's just oil field workers and fishing, nothing else. There's no shopping, there's nothing. That sounds like a good place to retire. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys have a rock and hot. Hey, day. Howard, thank you so very much.